And now, I hope everyone can see the screen. Let me get to the beginning. All right, this is lesson two in our course on the Psalms. I'm Dory Kenyon, a ruling elder here at Wallace. And the topic today is going to be um, creation. Just um, a review of our goals for today. Uh, some of the technological ground rules, the course syllabus really quickly. And our focal Psalm for today is Psalm 8. We'll do an, an initial view of Psalm 8. And then I'm going to talk about some Old Testament foundations to Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is quoted by New Testament writers. Psalm 8 is quoted by Jesus. A brief review of the key ideas the assignment for next week, and then have time for questions and discussion. I'm hoping that this will be about 30 minutes. Um, but as I say, I am just getting back into teaching and not sure about the timing. I'll, I will I'm going to do my best. So again, I'd like to make a class group email list. Because I'm recording and people come and go, I don't know uh, all of you who have come to into the class, but please send me a note. Um, as I say, if I have anything last minute or a handout that doesn't get up at the website, then I can mail it out to everybody. So thank, thanks to those who've already contacted me with their email address. Um, again, I'm recording this lecture part of each class. You're going to be muted. I'd appreciate if you have a question or comment write it down and also the slide number, which is in the bottom right hand corner, if that's helpful. And then at this part, I'm gonna stop recording and you can speak and we can discuss any questions or comments that you have. <clears throat> Again, in this course, um, the goals of the course are to help everyone um, in the course understand uh, some of the special characteristics of the book of Psalms in the context of biblical revelation. Um, as I'm discovering more and more, the Psalms are so rich and I feel like uh, in the course we can just, just touch the sur surface, but I hope we will um, touch relevant things that are gonna make your enjoyment and reading and understanding of the Psalms that much richer. Um, at the end of the day, I would like to be able to encourage everyone to use the book of Psalms in your personal worship to enrich your own daily walk with God. And especially, and as, as I said before, the organizing principle of this class is to understand how Psalms contains the whole biblical narrative of redemption. As Martin Luther said, um, it's the little Bible. And I just wanted to note, I didn't say this last week, that all scripture quotations that I'm using are from the uh, ESV that we use in worship at Wallace, unless otherwise noted. Um, again, uh, the syllabus, it is a handout that's up there at the um, website where you went to get into this class. Um, and version one is up there. I am going to be um, updating it for sure. But where we are today, and so we're focusing on the uh, history of redemption is creation and our focal Psalm, Psalm eight. So <clears throat> I came up with a visualization of how the lessons interact with the course goals. Again, our foundation is the creation, fall, redemption, restoration, the biblical narrative from Genesis to Revelation. Um, and it's all contained in the book of Psalms in marvelous ways. So we're going to have a focal Psalm or Psalm on each lesson. And I'm going to go through Old Testament foundations and then talk about um, the New Testament usage or where the New Testament quotes uh, that Psalm or those Psalms. But as I mentioned before, the whole goal of this, if it's only intellectual knowledge, we will not reach our goal is to um, 
understand the biblical revelation so that we might worship God and what he has done for us in his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate goal of this course. So using this outline, today's lesson, Psalm 8, is all about creation. And even more so, as we'll see, the Old Testament foundations we'll be looking at come from Genesis chapter 1. And the New Testament usage is from Hebrews 2, Ephesians 1, and Matthew 21. I put that in red because this is where Jesus himself quotes from Psalm 8. Dory, so, I'm sorry, you're, you're not screen sharing. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right, let me get to that. That was an oopsie. Can you see the screen now? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank okay. you. Oh, I am real sorry about that. Okay, so I'm just going to go back one slide and uh, an overview of today, Psalm 8 on creation, Old Testament foundation from Genesis 1. New Testament usage from Hebrews 2 and Ephesians 1, and then where Jesus himself quotes from Psalm 8 in Matthew 21. So first, an initial look at the psalm is, let me just read it out loud for us. The heading is in the scripture that where it says, to the choir master, according to the Gittith, a psalm of David. So that's considered part of the text. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is my man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him, him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So a few things I wanna point out at the beginning, again, in the heading, already it says to the choir master, the Psalms were meant to be sung and part of corp corporate worship right from the very beginning. It truly is uh, the hymnal of the people of God. And the second thing, according to the Giddith and the ESV, it has a footnote, probably a musical or liturgical term. There are some terms that come up, especially in the headings, we're not exactly sure anymore what it refers to, but this is probably something that had to do with um, the music or the setting of the song to be sung. Also, I want to point out, it is ascribed in the uh, Holy Scriptures as a Psalm of David. <clears throat> it's Psalm 8. That means it find, it's in the first book of Psalms. That book is um, probably all the Psalms are uh, attributed to David. There's a few that don't have headings, 
But um, this is there at the beginning is probably a very, very ancient psalm. Another thing in this initial look I want to talk about is it begins with, O Lord, our Lord. O Lord, our Lord. And I just, most of you know this already, but I just want to point it out as you read the Psalms, it's, this is kind of important. There's small ca caps in the first Lord in English. And why is that? Well, in Hebrew, if I were reading this out loud, I would say Adonai Adonehu. That's the first two words there. And that's how you would say it. And if you were reading it out loud in the congregation um, in Israel, in Jewish practice today, you would say Adonai Adonehu, which means, O oh Lord, our God. However, in the text, it has the name of God. Hebrew originally, the Hebrew scriptures did not have vowels. And so the first, uh, the letters there, the letters on top are Y-H-W-H. -H. Scholars now agree it was probably pronounced or could be pronounced as Yahweh. I'm not gonna go into this except quote at the bottom of this screen, what the publishers put in the beginning of uh, Palmer Robertson's book. And I thought they gave a very good explanation. I'll read it out loud. In a number of places throughout this work, the divine name Yahweh, whose distinctly covenantal meaning was revealed to Moses in Exodus 3, is rendered as covenant Lord or Lord of the covenant. This representation of Yahweh communicates the principal distinctiveness of this name for God. The term Yahweh sounds awkward in English and communicates little to the reader. Substitutions as the hybrid Jehovah and the capitalized Lord or small Lord do little to communicate the uniqueness of this term Yahweh is distinctly the Lord of the covenant, the covenant Lord. So the point I'm making here is the term God, Elohim, that can be used for gods anywhere, everywhere, all the gods. And we're going to come across that today, actually. But Yahweh, the covenant Lord, this was his name in relationship to his people. So when it says, O oh Lord, our Lord, this it's good to remember that this is distinctly God in relationship to his people. So <clears throat> Old Testament foundation should be pretty clear and pretty familiar here. Psalm 8, 3, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, that echoes Genesis. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And also the second half of verse 3, Genesis 14 through 19. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. The one thing I want to point out here is these phrases about the moon and the stars ruling over day and night, because that's a theme throughout this psalm. Another look at Old Testament foundation in Genesis 26 to 28, Psalm 8 echoes that. 
especially in verses four through eight. <clears throat> what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with honor and glo glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. And that clearly echoes Genesis, especially 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And what I want to point out here and emphasize is God being made, man being made in God's image, God making man in his image. And if you look back at Psalm 8 verse 5, what's highlighted in red, it says, Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. And the ESV has a footnote and says that could be translated than God. And in the Septuagint, even it could be translated than the angels. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament writings. And what we need to remember is it was translated some. Um, over a period of time, some 200 to 300 years before Jesus, and was very, very commonly used, and it is very commonly used by the Old Testament writers. In the Hebrew itself, it has the word Elohim, and Elohim is the basic word for God, but Elohim is a very unusual word in that it is in the plural for form. So it also sometimes gets translated as gods or heavenly beings or angels. The Hebrew Bible has Elohim in the uh, verse five. The Septuagint, the Greek, has uh, translated it into Greek with a word that really only has one meaning, meaning angels. But the most important thing, the idea that's being conveyed here is how God created man in his image, in his likeness, just a little bit lower than himself. The second thing I want to point out here, verse six, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That echoes of uh, Genesis 26, where it says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and so on. And then in verse 28 again, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Remember, I mean, the Psalms are just beautiful poetry, but verse three talked about the moon and the stars ruling the day and the night, um, the, the, the sun, moon, and stars, and then here, man having dominion. Now, I want to point out that all of this is a description in Genesis 1. This is all before Adam and Eve sin, before what we call the fall. And we need to keep that in mind as we continue um, this lesson. This is going to be very important that there's no 
discussion in Psalm 8 about the wicked and the righteous or about evil um, and sin in the world. Nope, nothing about forgiveness. So Psalm 8 is quoted several times in the New Testament. I'm going to highlight two times by New Testament writers and one time um, by Jesus himself. If we look at Hebrews 2, where there's a whole argument about who is Jesus, the author of Hebrews says this, for it is not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. The author goes on to write, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So the author of the letter to the Hebrews has taken this quote from Psalm 3, and he is saying that under the influence of the Holy Spirit, this, these verses support that Jesus is the son of, of man. And I sort of put in this quote that, and this is one way of interpreting Hebrews, that when the author writes now in putting everything in subjection to him, he's talking about the him being mankind, but we don't see it that way. In fact, but we do see him, Jesus, who indeed was made. And he, uh, the author uh, following the Septuagint is saying, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, but now after his resurrection has been crowned with glory and honor, namely because of the death that he suffered on our behalf, that he might taste death for everyone. And I'm going to follow up on this here that the New Testament sees Jesus as the second Adam. Now, Adam is a proper name. We use it as a proper name, but that is the Hebrew word for man. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man is uh, Benny Adam, the son of man, that you care for him. We just, some of us have just finished uh, Mike Sherrod's course on Romans 5 through 8. And I have these two um, verses from Paul clearly showing how God created man, Adam, and we'll get to this more next week, Adam fell, and then another man came in his place who was the true man, the perfect man, who, who fulfilled what the first man couldn't. So in Romans 5, 15 and 19, Paul writes, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinner, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Clearly referring to Adam's trespass and the obedience of Jesus Christ. So when the author of Hebrews is saying that this verse is really talking about Jesus 
and not all mankind in general, he is supporting the same view of Paul, that there's only one true man untouched by the fall, the man Christ Jesus. Now, remember when we looked at the verse, there's a lot about the rule and dominion. Well, Psalm 8 says in verse 6, you have put all things under his feet. Paul, at the beginning of Ephesians, also echoes this, quoting that part of verse 8. I'm going to just start in the 19th verse here. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his, God's power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, who, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So verse 22, and he, meaning God, put all things under his, meaning Jesus Christ's feet. And there, Paul deliberately seems to have quoted the same phraseology as Psalm 8, putting all things under his feet. Well, in creation, man was to have dominion over the sheep and oxen and all these um, created things. But Jesus Christ, the true man, the perfect man has dominion over everything. Again, it's just so beautiful. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. When man was created, he would have some dominion over the created realm. Jesus Christ, the perfect man, now has dominion over all things and for our benefit. i just like to point out how Jesus quotes Psalm 8. In verse 2 of Psalm 8, in the Hebrew Bible, it says, Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and avenger. Now, in Matthew 21, this is after Palm Sunday. Jesus has entered Jerusalem. He entered the uh, temple and cleansed the temple. And the text um, goes on and says, Matthew 21, 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he, Jesus, healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So <clears throat> the son of David is clearly a messianic title, the one who was to come. And we're going to get more into that in the course. And it says here that the chief priests and the scribes in the temple were absolutely indignant that Jesus wasn't doing anything. He was allowing the children to be yelling uh, these things in the temple. And so they said to him, don't you hear what these people are saying, what these kids are saying, what these children are saying? And Jesus said, have you never read? 
clearly Jesus is quoting something from scripture saying, have you never read? And he quotes Psalm 8:2, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. Now that prepared praise is the Septuagint translation. The Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures several hundred years before Jesus time. And of course, the Gospel of Matthew is presented to us. We have it now um, in Greek. That was what people were familiar with. And again, a note on the Hebrew Bible, it says establish strength. The Hebrew Masoretic text uh, basis actually, Masoretic means the vowels were put in. And that was completed about 700, between 700 and 900 years um, after the time of Jesus. And so there are differences between the Septuagint, which was translated several hundred years before Jesus of the Hebrew scriptures at that time and the Hebrew Bible. But what I want to point out here is and we're going to find this again and again. Jesus quotes part of a psalm to make his listeners think about the whole psalm. And here, Jesus stopped at prepared praise, but that verse goes on because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. So Jesus is saying to his critics, you know, God is doing something to silence his critics, even out of the mouth of children, out of the mouth of babies and infants. He has prepared praise to um, quell the taunts of the foes. And so in this way, Jesus has quoted Psalm 8. To tell you the truth, when I made the um, syllabus, I didn't realize how widely Psalm 8 had been used in the New Testament. And there's a couple uh, other allusions to Psalm 8. So I want just to review the key ideas. First, when we read, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, we're thinking of the one God, the covenant God, the God who has reached out to his people. And that verse also reminds me of the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Just describing glory to God's name. Just remember that Jesus one is, uh, Genesis one is echoed in Psalm eight is describing creation before Adam and Eve's disobedience and sin. Man, third point, man was created in God's image to have dominion over all creation. God has dominion over everything. Man was created to have dominion over creation. But as the writer Point four is the writer of Hebrew clarifies man no longer has that kind of dominion, not even over all of creation. However, Jesus, as the second Adam, was made lower than the angels. He is true man and is indeed is now crowned with glory and honor. What the first Adam couldn't do live in obedience to God and obey God, the second Adam has done on our behalf, our mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. And doing that, he is crowned with glory and honor after the resurrection. Point five, indeed, as Paul in Ephesians notes, all things have been put under the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. And point six, Jesus quoted Psalm 8, to silence the foe, 
we'll find Jesus linking the historical events that are part of his life. We'll see this again and again to his being the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of Man. And I didn't have here, as the children were crying, the Son of David. So we see all this in this one very short psalm. And this is one of the reasons why I read a quote this week uh, from Thomas Hooker that said, all the flowers that appear throughout scripture are brought together in a beautiful garden in the book of Psalms. And um, Martin Luther, not only calling this the um, uh, little Bible, but one of the great insights of the Reformation is that Christ is the key to the entire scriptures, including the Old Testament. And here, in this exa little example in Psalm 8, we see how it needs to be understood in light of the birth, life, death, and resurrection all that God has accomplished in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So our assignment next week is going to be looking at the fall, something very, very different. Um, and I'd like you to get acquainted with Psalms uh, 58, 1, and 51. Um, 58, you're going to dive head long into the issues of what happened after the fall. Also, I've um, put in the syllabus some psalms that um, echo the theme that we talked about in the lesson. And so they're listed there in the syllabus, which you can get um, at the website or, or, or by writing to me. Um, I'm just going to um, close with just a reminder. I would love to make a class list. That's going to make communication a lot better. If you have a question and don't, we don't get a chance to talk about it, you can write it to me at Kenyon at wallacepsaid.org. And now if I do this correctly, I am going to um, keep up the screen sharing, but stop stop the recording 